very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mandy. Just a quick thing. Uh, there are some amazing illustrations in my presentation. Uh, now, I didn't make those. I'm a developer. They're by Burnt Toast Creative. I have a slide at the end. They are on Twitter. They're awesome. Um, but you'll see them as you go through and you'll appreciate them as much as I did. So, why are we talking about HTML? Because there are a lot of amazing things to talk about, as we've discovered today, um, with all the awesome streams and talks and things. Uh, but for me, um, I think the re I, get, I get asked why I made this presentation, because a lot of people think that HTML is really simple. And, you know, it, I would say it probably is a simple language to learn and work with. Uh, we can get something going very quickly, we can accomplish things quite, quite quickly, and uh, it's very forgiving if we make mistakes. But I think sometimes that we make the mistake that assuming because it's simple, it's not valuable. And with, you know, all the amazing things with JavaScript and CSS uh, and all the other programming languages and technologies that are out there, we forget that HTML is an important part of what we do on the web. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story about how I wrote this presentation just for some context and, and why I came to write it. And it was because last year, around this time, I was in Melbourne speaking at Code, and I was talking about uh, CSS. And I happened to be on a CSS panel, and a question came up. And the question was, uh, does anybody hire people who only write CSS and HTML? And the answer was no. People don't do that anymore because JavaScript is really important, and it's the most valuable programming language for the web. I was a bit disappointed by this because I still think that there's a lot of value in HTML and CSS, and I think there's value uh, in people learning it. But because of that, I wrote an article. Um, you may or may not have read it. It was called, Is There Any Value in People Who Cannot Write JavaScript? Uh, yeah, the title's a little bit emotive, and um, for everyone who bothered to read it before commenting, uh, yeah, there were a lot of comments and a lot of people didn't read the article before they, they responded. It basically, the TLDR was that, yes, I do think there's value in people who don't write JavaScript. I think there's value in people who only write JavaScript, who only write HTML and CSS, who do all of it, who do all sorts of things. But I do think that people who write HTML and have a deep understanding of it, or at least use it to its full potential, is becoming very rare. At least it feels that way to me. And when I wrote this article, there were a lot of opinions about it. Uh, a lot of them weren't very nice. Uh, I don't read the comments anymore. Uh, but a lot of other people had opinions about this and they wrote blog posts and they had discussions about it and podcasts and tweets and all sorts of things. And it was all around the purpose and the role that HTML and CSS in this case play in a world where JavaScript is king and is what everybody cares about and what everyone is hiring for. But for me, it's really, really simple. HTML is a part of the web. It always has been. And we need to consider a variety of people, tools and technology that consume our web pages. And it's not just about the tech that we have now, like the browsers or assistive technology search engines, or even apps that consume our sites. It's about whatever comes next in the future. We have technology now like the Google Home and Alexa. What happens when they try to read our websites? Are they going to interpret it and consume it the way that we expected it to? So what I want to talk about today, I don't want to teach you HTML. What I want to talk about is how different technologies consume our websites and consume our HTML and how we can do some things to try and make sure that it has its best opportunity and best chance to be interpreted and consumed and represented the way that we want it to, regardless of where it is. So that brings me to my talk, which is functional HTML. Now, I must uh, admit, I mean, obviously, my article is probably poorly titled. Um, I didn't really think about the whole functional programming thing when I named this. Uh, it, 
that's not why I called it that. I'm not talking about functional programming and HTML. So if you came here thinking that, I apologize. You should still stay because it's going to be great. But the reason I called it functional HTML is because uh, I've heard this quote or phrase from developers that I've worked with for years. And that's, I'm just making it functional right now. And what that typically translates to is I'm just writing the JavaScript, you know, the functional parts. I'll make it pretty later. And the problem with this is that when we, what we're doing is we're relegating HTML and CSS to just making things pretty. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Because for something to be functional, it should be practical and useful. It needs to be working properly and as we expect it to. And not just for someone looking at it in a browser, but for any technology that tries to look at our websites. However, given that the browser is the most common way that people consume our websites, I want to talk quickly and very, very simply about how the browser interprets our HTML. Now, I'm going to preface this with, obviously, it's way more complicated than the three icons I'm going to show you. But uh, I just wanted to touch on it quickly. So first, we type our code like that cat in the GIF. And we give the browser our sweet HTML file. And we're like, cool, there you go, browser. Take my HTML. And then it takes that and it looks at it. Uh, but it doesn't just take our HTML and, and make the page. Like, it, it actually has to construct the page from that. And what it does is it gets this big, long string. And it goes through and it starts to create all of the parent and child relationships that we've presented in our HTML. And this it just goes through everything until it gets to the end. And that's how we get uh, the DOM tree or the document object model. And that's what you see typically when you inspect your code in the browser, like in Chrome or Firefox or whatever. And that's how we manipulate, edit, and move things around in our documents. Now, in order for it to actually display, there are a couple more steps, the paint and composite processes, which I won't go into. But why does it matter what our browser and how it interprets our HTML. And I think it matters because what the browser does, constructs is based on what we give it. So if we request a div, it gives us a div. If we give it something that it doesn't understand or like dogs are amazing element, it's still going to put that in the page and it's still going to render your content. It doesn't care what the HTML elements are. It's just going to construct the parent and child relationships. It gives us what we've asked for. So on that note, we're just going to take a brief sidestep and talk about TypeScript. Um, has anyone here used TypeScript or Flow or anything? OK, cool, a few people. So for those that don't know, TypeScript is a typed JavaScript language. It does everything that JavaScript does plus some other things. Uh, and basically, it makes use of static typing. So you can give your variable a type when you write your code. Uh, and then what it does uh, at compile time is it goes and it checks that the uh, type of content or data that you're passing through to your variables matches what you asked for. And if it doesn't, it throws an error. So this is some TypeScript. It's an interface for a dog. It's got a name, which is a string, an age, which is a number and a is fluffy, which is a Boolean, so true or false, because not all dogs are fluffy. Um, they're all amazing, but they're not all fluffy. Uh, and in this case, we're assigning the type to our data and whether or not we want to get what we want to get from that content. And if I pass a number to my name, it'll throw an error and it'll say, no, no, you said you wanted a string. You've given me a number. And you can go and do something about that. And what we're doing is we're telling TypeScript what we expect our data to be. And this makes debugging, reading, writing, and working with our code a lot easier, at least in my opinion. We're being really explicit about what the shape of our data should be. And this is pretty much what we do in HTML. We specify whether we want a heading, what kind of heading it should be. If we need a list, navigation items, links, buttons, bold, italic, images, captions. We 
we're choosing an element that best represents our content. And there are a whole range of elements that we can use in order to mark up our content correctly. And we do this for the same reason we do it in TypeScript, to define the shape of our content, to make it easier to work, read, and write. And not just for us, but for whatever tech tries to consume it. And in TypeScript, we have this concept of an any type. And an any type means basically that my name can be anything. It can be a number, a Boolean, a string. And this can be useful on occasion. But if you type everything as any, you start to lose the benefits of the language because you're no longer getting the type checking. It's not going to throw an error when you pass a number to name. The safety that TypeScript provides is gone and it becomes pointless. And this is the same in HTML if you use divs everywhere. You're not making the most of the language. So because of this, it's really important that we actively choose what the right element for our content is and you don't just default to using a div. And if we look at a really simple example of a page about why dogs are good, just using divs, this is what it'd look like in the browser. It's just default browser styling. Everything is a div, even the links, which I've added a JavaScript's on click event to to make it clickable. And you can see that the page is a bit unstructured. There isn't really much meaning except from the white space that we get from the div being a block element. Whereas if we look at a more semantic page, which has properly chosen HTML elements, like lists and links and images and big captions, headings, you can see a structure starts to form. And there's value in this. It's already more practical and more useful than this page because we, we have a hierarchy. And you might be thinking, well, okay, sure, but I could make this look like this with CSS. And you're right, you could. But the problem with that is that not everything that consumes your page is going to have access to your CSS and your JavaScript. They're going to evaluate your page based on the HTML that you've provided. It doesn't care about all the other stuff that you've done. And it's easy to assume that the way our HTML is going to be consumed is going to be the same way that we as developers and the creators of the site can see it in our browser. But there are so many different technologies that will try to read, use, understand and consume our HTML and they rely on us to use the language properly in order for it to make sense. So the first one I wanted to talk about is assistive tech. Now using HTML as it's intended helps us to build web pages and applications that can be used by a wide range of people in a wide range of circumstances. And there are a bunch of different options in the assistive tech space. There's screen readers, brow readers, switches, even the Google Home and Alexa are being used by people as a form of assistive technology. I'm going to focus on the screen reader today mainly because that's the one I know how to use ish. Uh, but before I do my screen reader demo, I wanted to talk about the accessibility tree because I think a lot of people don't actually know that it exists. And much like the browser creates the DOM, it takes the DOM tree and it modifies it to form something that's useful to assistive technology. And that's what the accessibility tree is. And it uses native semantics to create an interface for reading and navigating the page. For example, a screen reader is able to interpret the accessibility tree and reproduce the text as speech. And some things are stripped out, so anything that is not useful for someone who can't see the page, that's removed. But other things are added in. So around forms and interactions, for example, additional context is provided to make uh, understanding the page easier. So, if we take that div only example of dogs are good uh, earlier, what does that sound like to a screen reader? What, what does a div only page, how does it get interpreted by assistive technologies like a screen reader? So to make it easier for you, because uh, when I did this the first time for my coworkers, they couldn't follow along and they were very confused. Uh, I have uh, captions which are down the bottom 
And then also it'll highlight every line as we go through. This is using voiceover on the Mac. Fingers crossed our sound works. Oh, dogs are good. I job web content. You are currently on web content. Dogs are good. I job web content. Home. Good dogs. Bad dog myths. Dogs. They are good. We are dedicated to educating the world on why dogs are good and how they can make your life good. Bye. Mandy Michael. Comma. August. 3. Road. 2. 0. 1. 8. Why are dogs good? Dogs are loyal, intelligent, devoted and affectionate. They are known to improve our physical and mental health. Mitchie and Jello also known as Jello. Slash screen percent. 2. 0. Shot percent. 2. 0. 2. 0. 1. 8. Okay, I won't, I won't make you listen to that. Uh, so, uh, firstly, the image. Let's address that, seeing it was the last thing. I did that by accident, uh, if I'm being honest. I screenshotted that picture of my dog, Jello. Uh, Michelangelo, just FYI, the screen reader clearly had trouble with that, um, from Instagram. And I forgot to change the file name, and because I was making a not awesome HTML page, I didn't put an alt tag on it. So it had to read out a very long, really horrible file name. So lesson number one, rename your files, um, or better, add an alt tag. But, uh, you know, when, you, when you're reading through that page, it, it's kind of just a big blob of text, right? And it didn't even tell me that the top three things were linked. There was no way for me to know that because the screen reader doesn't know that those divs with that on-click event were actually pages that, that I could go to and I could visit. And that can be pretty confusing because you've just kind of got to guess based on the fact that there are no other words after it. But typically, people using assistive technology will listen to this at a much faster pace. So they might not notice that if there's no hierarchy or structure there. And often, they would use keyboard shortcuts or other ways to navigate around the page so they don't have to read it from top to bottom. And sometimes, they do this with headings, for example. So they can skip to different headings on the page and go, oh, yeah, I want to I find out why they're good or the related links, or did you know, which is further down the page. But without those cues, they're forced to read everything. Or more likely, they're just going to leave because, uh, you know, that's a pain, especially when they get to my really horrible file name on my image, which is a shame because then they won't find out why dogs are good. So what about the structured, uh, more semantic version of my page? What does that sound like in a screen reader? Same again, captions and, and highlighting. You are currently on web content. Dogs are good. I job web content. Navigation main navigation one item. List three items. Visited. Link. Home. Link. Good dogs. Link. Bad dog myths. Heading level one. Dogs. They are good. We are dedicated to educating the world on why dogs are good and how they can make your life good. Mandy Michael. August 3rd, 2018. Heading level two. Why are dogs good? Dogs are loyal, intelligent, devoted, and affectionate. They are known to improve our physical and mental health. A dog named Michiel and Jello, also known as Jello, image. The group international. So, you can already hear in that example that it's a lot better. It tells me up front that I've got navigation items, how many there are, that I've visited a link, what links are. It tells me what a heading one is, what a heading two is. It didn't read out a really long file name. It's already providing us more context and information to navigate the page with. And this isn't just valuable for screen readers, but potentially also really useful for uh, Google Home and Alexa to be able to uh, navigate around the page based on voice commands. So uh, my point here is don't just use divs because you're losing out on all that free information that you get by just picking the right HTML element. Otherwise, you're going to have to put a lot more work in to try and get that content to make sense to someone else. And I'm going to quote uh, Jeffrey Zeldwin because I read this article recently and I loved it. But uh, to build for people and the long term, then simple, structural, semantic HTML was best. Each element deployed for its intended purpose. Don't use a div when you mean a P or a paragraph. And there are a lot of things that we can do to make our HTML read better for screen readers and other technologies like search engines as well. And one of those things is using sectioning elements. 
And what sectioning elements do is they create a document outline, and that's used by the accessibility tree to form an outline of what is on the page. Now, prior to HTML5, we didn't have sectioning elements. We just had divs. And that made automating a document outline impossible because there's no way to know the difference between a section marked up as a div and just a div that's used for presentational purposes. So now that we have sectioning elements, the browser can automate a document outline that can be used by search engines, screen readers, and other apps and code that try to read our page. And that's incredibly valuable and powerful, and it's not that much work to implement. Now, there are four sectioning elements. The section, unsurprising. Uh, this represents a standalone section that has no other semantic meaning. And because it's used in the document outline, you should never use this if you want a generic container. If you want a generic container, use a div. I know I said don't just use divs, but generic containers are what divs are for. The article is another one, and this is used for uh, self-contained parts of the page. So if you think about content that can be um, redistributed or reusable, like in syndication, you use the article element. And this is used a lot for blogs, news articles, forums, that kind of thing. Nav is another one which you heard in the screen reader demo. This provides context around navigation items. And it's used for table of contents, main nav, that kind of stuff. And then there's the aside, which is my favorite. Uh, this is used to mark up content around uh, that, that's not part of the main outline. And I like this because it's great in like news articles, for example, when people are trying to shove stuff in the middle of that article that you're trying to read. If you mark that up as an aside, it's ignored in the main outline of the page. Sidebars, call out boxes, that kind of thing. And you can use these in conjunction with a more clear structure and hierarchy. And this allows search engines to better understand the content that we're writing and what's the most valuable content on the site. Headings are one thing that a lot of people don't use that well, to be honest. The H1 is used to represent the main purpose of the page. H2 to H6, all subheadings. And a screen reader can take a list of headings from your page, create that, and allow users to get a read through all of those and decide if they want to actually read the page at all. It gives them an idea of what's on the page, and that's really, really useful. So you should always use a heading inside your sections. A header element is another one. This isn't a sectioning element, but it is used to provide context around the header of your page, like main navigation, search, logos, that kind of thing. And there's a footer element as well, which does the same for footer content, and a main element that does the same for the main part of your page. But we should also make the most of built-in functionality because we've got enough to do, right? We have to do linting, write tests, write a shit ton of JavaScript. You know, I don't have time to rebuild the web. I've got other things to do. And a really good example of that is the link or the anchor element. This comes with so much for free that people are not taking advantage of. It navigates the user to a new page, it changes the URL, it causes the browser to redraw and refresh, it's focusable with the href element uh, attribute, it can register a click with the enter key, it has visited, focus, hover, link, and active of, uh, states, and it allows opening a new window, all for free. You don't have to do anything, that will just work when you use the link. And yet, for some reason, we keep using divs and trying to recreate that. I don't know about you, but I would rather be patting my dog than spending time making something open in a new window with JavaScript. And the same goes for the button element, right? This can be focused by default. You can click it with the space key. It can be disabled with the disabled attribute. It can submit and reset a form. You can show focus, hover, active, and disabled states by default. Like, don't spend your time remaking something that already exists. And if you don't know when to use a button versus an anchor or a link, a good rule of thumb is a link navigates to a new page, a button toggles something in your interface. 
The way that I like to think of it is if it has a href, it's a link. If it doesn't, or you're disabling the href, it's probably a button. Uh, I mean, obviously there are exceptions to this, but that's a good place to start. And probably the best thing about HTML is that you can combine them to create even better and more improved co uh, context. And a great example of this is the figure and the fig caption. These are self-contained units of content. And it means that you can move it around the page and it'll still make sense. And inside the fig caption, you can put other elements like paragraphs and headings to give even more information and context. And inside of the figure with the fig caption, you can put the pre-element. And the pre-element marks up pre-formatted text. And if you combine that with the figure and the fig caption, then you get a more accessible uh, pre-formatted text on your page. And when this is rendered with a monospace font on its own, the screen reader tries to read out each character by itself, which is not great. So the figure and fig caption marks the code up as a figure and the fig caption as the description. And the abbreviation and definition elements, which are my favorite, these are so great. I wish people used these more. It allows browsers and bots and us to recognize that a phrase is being defined and that that acronym is associated to the phrase. So for example, I actually put code up for this because it's hard to explain, but we have a description about the International Good Dogs Association, which determines that all dogs are good. And we have an abbreviation of IGDA, and that's wrapped in the abbreviation element, and that has a title of International Good Dogs Association. And then inside that, uh, outside of that, we wrap it in the definition element, and that says, that this paragraph is defined, defining IGDA, which is an abbreviation of International Good Dogs Association. And all the tech understands that because it's part of HTML. And there are heaps of elements. There's the progress bar, there's bidirectional, which is that um, byte I one. That makes text go right to left instead of left to right. KBD marks up keyboard controls if you need to display those. There's video, which gives you video controls. There's a dialogue, audio, time. And this is just a tiny little bit. And you don't have to remember them all because the Mozilla Developer Network has a totally amazing page that you can just search. And it'll give you back a list of them. And it'll tell you how you can use them. And I kind of think that, like I said before, with all of the other things that we need to do with our deployment processes and our build chains and our naming things, our tests and using TypeScript, like make your life easier and save a heap of time by just picking the right HTML element because it makes your project more understandable, but it also makes, like to me as a developer, but also to people trying to use it and technology trying to consume it. But I could talk about those all day and I don't want to do that. So what I want to show you is the way that some other tech consumes our HTML. And a really good example of this is reading apps uh, like Instapaper and Pocket. And what they do is they take structured content and they display it with custom styles. And they provide improved readability and options for personalization. And people can use these for all sorts of reasons better accessibility, so improved contrast, for example, or the aesthetics, because what these do is they strip out all of the extra junk on a page, like ads, for example. So it's just a nicer experience. Now, I use Instapaper, so this is the one I'm going to start with. Um, and what this does is it allows you to save articles and you can read them later in their reading mode. And this is what the div version looks like in their reading mode. Now, it kind of looks like the same as before, right? But it's different color. Not very well structured. We, we already understand that. But what about the, the better, more semantic version? It kind of looks like the other page, right? They've managed to apply their own styles to my links and my lists and my headings. But also, at the top, you'll notice the links aren't there anymore. And that's because we don't need the links in this context. And because I marked them up as a navigation item, it can remove those, which is great. It's also put my name and the date up the top. And this information is really important in Instapaper because 
I have like 400 articles that I'm, I'm meaning to get to. If I don't have who wrote it and when, how am I going to know if that's still relevant to me or if I can trust the person that wrote that article? Or if I think Mandy Michael writes really sweet articles with non-offensive titles, I can go and read those later. It's really important, not just for the user, but from a publisher's perspective, because if I want people to think my content is great and I don't tell them that I wrote it, how will they know to come back and read more of what I've written? Now, Pocket is another example. It does the same thing as Instapaper, but this one's really interesting. I didn't actually use Pocket, so I had to play around with this a bit to get it to work. And this is what it looks like in the web view. This is both of my, my pages, one with divs, one with semantic HTML. This first one, obviously the div version. You'll notice that the title is different. That's because there's no H1 on my page. So instead of putting the H1 in there, it used the title element, which is the only title it could find. There's no image. Even though I did use an image element in the page to load the image in, it couldn't find it. Sometimes it would load random text from the page, like from anywhere, it didn't really matter where, which was weird. I also couldn't read it in their reading app. It, I had to open it in a new window uh, from the original page. And it was really clear to me that Pocket was having a bit of trouble understanding what to do with my div only page. It even took longer to process, which is weird because the page isn't very big. And the most interesting thing I came across was the desktop app. So while the mobile app, I couldn't read it in their app at all, the desktop one I could, but it flagged my content as being not article content and that I thought was a bit weird. And from a like publisher perspective or from a brand perspective, that's probably quite damaging because when I saw that, the first thing I thought was, oh, is there something like bad about that page and then I was like, no, no, I made this page, it's fine. <laughs> but it's like a box at the top, you know, it's scary. UX. Now, the more semantic version already looks better. It's got a cute doggo on it, it's got the right title, I can open it up in their reading app, it looks pretty good. They've put their own styles in. Great. Also at the top, it's got my name and the date, much like Instapaper did. And this is really, really awesome. Win. So the other one I looked at was Safari reading mode. Now this one's my favorite because in Safari, it's there by default. You click the little lines next to the URL bar. If it's not there, there's something wrong with your page. Uh, I'll be honest, the div version did not work. I could not use Safari reading mode on it, which was unfortunate but I could use my more semantic content. However, it didn't really work that well and I kind of misled you a tiny bit. Pocket and Instapaper originally didn't put my name and byline at the top of the page. And Safari reading mode was missing content. There was no bullets, no quotes, no links further down and bits, even paragraphs were missing and I was very, very confused. I did not know what was going on and I panicked a little bit because the whole point of my presentation was that HTML and semantic HTML mattered and, you know, this is how technology consumes your sites and I was like, my life is a lie, I don't know what to do, HTML, ugh. So I panicked big time and I went on Twitter, as I do when I panic, that's a mistake, don't do that. <laughs> um, and I realized I'd made a really big mistake. I got in a bit of a Twitter conversation with someone about Safari's reading mode and I'd forgotten about the HTML attributes. Arguably the most powerful part of HTML. There's not just elements in HTML, they have a whole bunch of attributes that you can use in order to provide more context and information to your page. So I went through this process of adding the right HTML elements and then in Safari reader mode, I got a description, I got my name and my byline at the top of the article and I was like, yes, this works, HTML is not a lie, it's fantastic, I don't have to cancel my presentation, huzzah. Uh, now, before I tell you how I did that, I'm gonna mention search because it is related but we will get back to it. 
Now, search, they rely on, on like crawlers and bots that index your website's content. And then it uses an algorithm to determine the relevance of the content to our search keywords. Now, search engine crawlers behave a lot like screen readers. They can't, at least for now, intelligently understand audio, video, and imagery. So they rely on text alternatives and well-written content to kind of understand what the value of your page is. And if you look at a Google result, what it does is it takes the title element from your page, and then it takes the H1 and then H2 to provide an idea of what the content on the page is. But when the page's HTML structure isn't clear, it can have a really negative impact on this. Also, it can impact where your search result appears on which page in Google. Because it's much harder for the search engines to identify the type of content that you might find on the page. And the more information and context that you give these bots and the crawlers, the better they can match your content to relevant keywords. So, keeping in mind the reading apps and search engines and how search engines rely on more context and information to match to keywords, this brings me to microdata. Now, microdata is used to nest metadata on existing content in web pages. Search engines, web crawlers, uh, apps, assistive tech, they all process metadata from a web page and use it to provide a richer browsing experience for users. And in order to use it, we can make use of something called schema.org. Uh, now, schema.org is a collection of vocabularies about various types of content. And there are a bunch of them online. This one's probably the most popular and it is used by the major search engines. And this allows uh, other technologies to understand what our content is. And there are all types of vocabularies like person, article, creative work, publisher, so on. There are heaps. The website's pretty ugly, but it's worth checking out. Now, in order to use it, we can use HTML attributes, specifically item scope, item type, and item prop. So I'm going to show you how I got my name at the top of the reading apps by defining person as metadata on my page. Now, the way that I did this was I have a paragraph, and inside that I have by Mandy Michael. And on the paragraph, I add the item scope. And what this does is it creates a new item, and it says anything inside that paragraph is considered part of the scope of my item. Then I add the item type, and I choose a vocabulary from schema.org. In this case, I went with person. And what this does is it says this item's context is about a person. And it looks at the schema.org uh, person structure, and it's like, cool, cool, that's a person. I know what to do with that. Now, the last step is defining a child of that item. So in this case, I wanted to mark myself up as the author. So I wrapped my name in a span and I added the attribute of item prop. And the value of that is author, which is part of the person schema. There are all sorts of things that you can do, age, gender, if you want to, what you're good at, CSS, patting dogs, buying really amazing pants. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, you can put all sorts of information around uh, what a person does, who they are, uh, and this helps to provide more content. So if you search for Mandy Michael, uh, it would probably come up with my Our Dogs, Why Dogs Are Good article. And this is really important because we have to remember that sometimes HTML elements are not enough. We need to provide additional context and information using metadata and other attributes because Technology can't tell the difference between a paragraph with my name in it and a paragraph with some other random text from the page. So we need to make our content more explicit. And there are all sorts of HTML attributes that we can do use in order to do this. So ARIA attributes are another really good one that's used by assistive tech. You can use that to mark up the content on your page to be more well understood and provide more context for screen readers. So you can use uh, ARIA label on your navigation element 
to say this is main nav or this is footer nav or related links. You can add a role of search on your uh, inputs so that they know that it's search. You can add a type of email on an input and say, hey, I expect an email in this. This is all really useful and valuable context and information that we can provide the browser and other technologies with how to use our page. Now, I've only really shown a very small, tiny example of different technology that tries to use our websites and how they try to consume and interpret and display our content. And the impact that HTML plays in making that work. Now, there are a lot of other browsers, and aside from Chrome and Firefox, there are a lot of search engines, there are a lot of apps. And they all are going to rely on that semantic HTML. Uh, yesterday, I was in, in Melbourne at Code, and Jason um, O'Neill, he's from Perth, he did an amazing presentation on speech synthesis and how important HTML was in order for technology to synthesize and uh, use and read and interpret content on our pages using speech and uh, I forget what the other one is called. Really, really important. And sound is only going to become more valuable as people start trying to navigate their website by voice commands. Like, hey, click on that or jump to that heading. If you don't use semantic HTML, you're not going to be able to do that and you're going to have to do all that work again instead of just doing it from the start. So what I'm hoping is that when you start writing your websites or your blog posts or even your tutorials and demos, that you choose the right HTML element and attributes to best represent your content because whilst a lot of us probably have a good understanding of HTML, there's new people starting every day in tech that don't know that. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they understand HTML's value and that they use it properly. Otherwise, we're letting them down and we're letting down anybody who tries to use our websites with not well-written HTML. And it's important to understand that HTML is not just the foundation that we build our websites on. It's vital in making sure that our websites are functional across different platforms and technologies and that they work as we expected them to. Because if you use HTML to its fullest from the beginning, you're not just saving yourself a heap of time by making the most out of its built-in features. You're making it more functional for people and for bots and for technology, not just for now, but whatever comes in the future. And yesterday when I was at Code, I said, HTML is kind of like that friend that was really, really good to you and did heaps for you. And then one day they were like, you don't care about me, you don't appreciate me, and they leave. And then you're like, oh shit, you did so much for me and you miss them because they're not there anymore. So I think we need to make sure that we value HTML as much as we do everything else because if it wasn't here, we would really feel the pain. So uh, that's all. But I did want to mention uh, Julie Grundy. She's from Perth. She helped me with the accessibility stuff. Ricky Mondello rescued me from my existential crisis on HTML's importance in Safari's reader mode. Uh, and also, of course, Burnt Toast Creative for their totally amazing illustrations. Thank you.